QuickBooks Online 2024. Generate reports after entering beginning balances. Get ready and some coffee because QuickBooks Online is even quicker to the trigger than Quick Draw McGraw. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunchy numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Get Great Guitars 2024 QuickBooks Online sample company file we set up in a prior presentation. So far, we've been setting up those foundational items necessary to be able to build our financial statements on top of with the help and use of the normal accounting cycle, most of those foundational items being found in the drop down cog up top. We looked at the your company section with the accounts and settings, set up our users. We looked at the primary lists, including the chart of accounts, as well as the products and services. We set up our customers, our vendors. We set up our payroll and employees. We brought in our beginning balances, which we imagined came from our worksheet over here that we're imagining came from our prior accounting system as of the end of December 31st, 2023 so that we have our beginning balances on the balance sheet and then the income statement will close out. We'll have nothing on the income statement for the current period that we're going to be working in in the new accounting system for that starting January 1st, 2024. Our strategy for entering these balances has simply been that we will enter them one at a time as opposed to uh, entering a full journal entry for all of them at one time so that we can take care of each of the special needs of each of the accounts. For example, the inventory having a sub ledger breaking out by item, by customer, by item, inventory item, accounts receivable having a sub ledger breaking out by customer, the accounts payable having a sub ledger breaking out by vendor. Now that we've entered this into the system, we want to review the reports that have been constructed. It's really useful when you're starting a new company file to look at the reports step by step as we have done with the balance sheet income statement, major financial statement reports, those, and then try to look at the other related reports because you get to see things built from the ground up. So that's what we'll do now. Let's go back on over and let's go into our reports. So when we look at the reports, it can be intimidating. I'll close up the hand boogie because we have all these different sections of reports and QuickBooks puts all these different reports within it. So, but don't be overwhelmed by that for a couple different reasons. One is that the major two financial statement reports are simply the balance sheet and income statement, otherwise known as uh, the profit and loss report, number one. I'm gonna unstar this one. And number two, the most of the other reports also a lot of them are going to be reports that that you can generate from the balance sheet and the income statement and quickbooks has already kind of adjusted them for you so they're kind of duplicate reports as well so let's open our major financial statements right clicking on the balance sheet and i'm going to open the link in a new tab i'm going to right click on the profit and loss otherwise known as the income statement open the link in a new tab we can also open the trial balance right clicking on it open it in a new tab let's go to the tab to the right close up the hamburger change the range i'm going to bring it back to 2023 which because we entered all of our data as of December 31st, uh, 2023. So let's go from 010123 to 123123 and run that. So we talked about the balance sheet basically in general, how it has been constructed. And we talked about uh, the equity section in particular, 
when we looked at the adjustment of the equity section in a prior presentation, this often being the section most confusing uh, to people in part because of the terminology around equity changing if you're in a different type of entity partnership versus sole proprietor versus corporation. But we looked at that before. Let's go to the profit and loss. Bring it back to 2023, 010123, tab 123123, tab. Run it to refresh it. We see data in the profit and loss for the prior year, but we noted that it's going to close out and be zero in 2024. Nothing will be in it thus far. That's what we want. And then we can go to the trial balance. This is just the balance sheet on top of the income statement. 010123 tab, 123123 tab, run it. So there's our balances here, balance sheet accounts, assets, liabilities, equity, and then income statement accounts, income and expenses. This trial, now when we do the normal data input, then what will happen? I will typically have on the left-hand side, our, our place that we can enter the data, meaning the forms, typically by cycle, customer, vendor, and employee, and then the reports on the right-hand side, which we can either see in the form of mat of a balance sheet and an income statement, or sometimes I would generally just have a trial balance open because what I wanna do is enter the forms. Every time I enter the forms, then look over here so I can drill back down to see what two accounts at least, because at least two accounts will be impacted in any financial transaction. It's actually recording something to the financial statements. And this report gives me all of those accounts without, without all the subtotals that I can drill down on back to the source document, which is great. So now that we have these major reports open, we can think about how other reports will be relating to these reports. All the other reports, for the most part, will be giving more information about one or multiple line items on these major financial statement reports. So let's go over and just review some of these reports and see how they might feed into the balance sheet and the income statement. So we have the business overview report. So we have an audit log. That's going to give us a log of who has done what, which is a great internal control report. Notice we have a balance sheet comparison, a balance sheet detail, a balance sheet summary, a balance sheet. These are all variants on the balance sheet, most of which you can actually create from a standard balance sheet, although the summary is a bit distinctive because it's you can kind of create it from the balance sheet but uh, if you create it from the summary it won't have those triangle drop downs so these reports are all in essence the same type of report the balance sheet report you got the profit and loss same thing you got the profit and loss as a percent of total income profit and loss comparison profit and loss detail profit and loss per date comparison profit and loss by customer profit and loss by month profit and loss by tag most of those are just variants on the profit and loss, which we can actually create from a standard profit and loss, which would be better to do typically. We have a whole course or section on that if you want to look at it in more detail. And we will take a, a look at it in a bit more detail when we get to the month end reports in our practice problem as we think about how we might group reports to provide to we're thinking a client in our practice problem, but a similar situation if you're providing them to a supervisor. And then you've got the projected uh, profitability summary uh, report. So this is a, a, a project report, sorry, project profitability. So this would be something that might be used in the job cost system if you're using projects. We have a whole nother course or section on that if you wanna dive into that in more detail. Uh, quarterly profit and loss, another type of profit and loss. And then we have the statement of cash flows. Now, the statement of cash flows is another financial statement report, a major financial statement report, but you construct it after you do the balance sheet and the income statement, the basic idea of it being that we want the balance sheet and the income statement to give us our information, ideally from accounting standpoint purposes on an accrual basis, because that's best for the income statement to be able to compare actual performance which can be skewed on a cash-based system by just adjusting the cash flow. Uh, so, but we would also like to have a statement of cash flows, which you could think of as kind of primarily the income statement on a cash basis because cash is so important. So to get the best of both worlds, we can have the balance sheet and the income statement on an accrual basis, and then the statement of cash flows, which can kind of rework 
in essence, mainly the, the income statement, but also some components on the balance sheet on a cash basis. So we'll take a look at that later when we get to the end and we have a whole nother section or course on reports if you want to look at that in more detail. So who owes you? These are all reports that you would think would give you more information on the balance sheet account of the accounts receivable for the most part. You'll recall that we entered the accounts receivable by just adding the customers, which are the people that would owe us if we charged them with an invoice. So if we have the, the invoices here, that's what increases the accounts receivable. We would then have to collect on that information. So these reports are those reports given more detail. So the accounts receivable aging detail is just going to list out who owes us the money and give us some detail about how old or past due they are. Accounts receivable aging summary, same thing, collection report, similar, customer balance detail, and the customer balance summary. This is a classic subledger. These are all types of subledgers, you might call them that are giving us detail about who owes us the money. Anderson, Jones, Smith owe us five, seven, five, and eight for a total of 20,500, which matches what's on the balance sheet here, 20,500. Back to the first tab. So we have the invoice and receive payments. That's kind of the activity reports. Invoices increase in accounts receivable, as we saw when we made the customers. Payments would be the things that decrease it that's the thing that's going to match out to the invoice when we get paid. Open invoices mean we invoiced something, someone and have not yet gotten paid. That means it's going to be an outstanding balance tied to accounts receivable. Uh, statement lists, these are lists of statements that we can create to try to collect on the receivables. Term uh, Terms lists, lists of the terms like net 30 and so on. Unpaid, uh, unbilled charges. These are internal reports. Same with unbilled time to try to track the time that we have entered that we need to invoice to charge the client for. Then you've got the sales and customers. All of these you would think would primarily be giving you more information about the income statement line items of income or revenue because these are going to be sales is typically another term for revenue or income. So you got the customer contact list. That's just a contact list of, of customers and their contact information. Deposit detail. It's a little confusing because it's not, it's a balance sheet report, but you're thinking that the, the deposits are coming from the customers, which is why they might put it in the kind of sales area. So estimates and progress invoicing. Estimates are going to be a form that doesn't record something on the balance sheet. It's an internal document, but it helps you to give like an estimate of how much you would charge someone before you do the work. Progress invoicing is a special area. We have another course or section on if you want to look at that in more detail for longer projects. Estimates by customer, again, estimates. Income by customer summary. So now we have our income line. That's going to be on the income statement over here. Sales, instead of having, notice we're generally going to start off with only two income lines, service income and product income. We're not going to list out all the different services or all the different products on the income statement because we could give sub reports breaking out by product, by service in detail, and we can have a sub account breaking out by customer. So this will give us our income, our revenue by customer, uh, inventory valuation. So they put these under the sales area because it's kind of part of cost of goods sold or we're selling to customers, although inventory is a balance sheet account. So they kind of stuff that one in here kind of it's a weird somewhat a weird of a location but that's giving us more detail on the balance sheet account of inventory which we would only have if uh, we're doing a perpetual inventory system which we did here and that means when we set up the inventory note what it did we just listed the inventory units we had and they used the inventory starting value form to record the information so that we have sub ledgers now which will tie out to that inventory. So if I open up an inventory valuation summary, for example, it's going to give us the backup detail because we're on a perpetual inventory system, giving us the inventory items, the units we have, and then the values adding up to 2,896, which should match what's on the balance sheet. Uh, inventory 2,896. Back to the first tab. Payment method list, this would be the methods of payments that would be on some of the forms that we could have like cash or check or credit card. Physical inventory worksheet, that's just something that'll help us to count the inventory because it'll give us the categories of inventory. Product service list, so this is going to be the products 
uh, that we have given us a list. Sales by customer detail, sales by customer summary. This is very similar to the income uh, by, by, by customer summary that we had over here somewhere. But it's the income, I think, is also going to give you the cost of goods sold if there was cost of goods sold, whereas the sales will, will just give you the sales line items. And then we got sales by, by customer type. If you have different customer types that you're grouping your customers into, and then we got sales by product service. Now we're looking at the income line of income or revenue, not breaking out the sales that we made, the revenue that we earned by customer, but rather by what we sold. That's going to be uh, the inventory or products and service or services. Uh, time activity by, by uh, customer, transaction list by customer. So we can list out the trans transaction list by tags. Tags is a specialty kind of thing like class tracking and location tracking. We have a whole nother course or section on that if you want to look at that. And then we got what you owe. You've got these 1099 reports in here. Uh, what, what you owe, by the way, this whole section before I get into it, you would think would be supporting the balance sheet account of accounts payable. Because if I go into the accounts payable, you will recall that we set that up by just setting up a vendor and saying that we owe the vendor 15000 then the system QuickBooks created a bill because a bill is the form that increases accounts payable. So if I go back then, all these reports you would think would tie into accounts payable. Now the 1099s are kind of an exception because that's a tax rule in the United States that we have to track for certain contractors. We'll talk more about that uh, in the future. Uh, we set up the, pay, the sales tax before, so you can look at that in more detail if you so choose as well. Notice these are kind of vestiges as well of the old sales tax setup because everything kind of is done now in the new widget format. And we have, we've looked at that in a section already. We'll touch on that again, possibly as we go through our practice problem. But the accounts payable aging breaks out who we owe the money to by vendor as well as by how old or outstanding it is accounts payable aging summary the bill payment list so bills are the things that increase the accounts payable so that's going to be and the payments are the things that we pay off the bills to connecting the bills to a payment which would be like a check or an expense form bills and applied payments so the bills increase the applied payments decrease so this will give us the detail about the accounts payable broken out by the increases and decreases rather than just by date. Uh, then the unpaid bills, unpaid bills should add up to the accounts payable balance, you would think, because they're bills that have not yet been paid. Vendor balance detail, this is the classic sub, sub ledger. So let's right click and open that one, which is basically just giving us a list, which is gonna be quite short for this one because we only have one vendor that's outstanding. But if we had a lot of vendors outstanding, the point is the summary of all the outstanding bits of the vendor would add up to the accounts payable here. So we have more detail, not just by date, which is what is in here in the transaction detail if I drill down, but by who we owe the money to. Back to the first tab, then we've got the expenses and vendors. You would think this would give us more detail about the income statement, expense line, line items. So if we go back on over and check them out, 1099, again, that's kind of a vestige of the old system because the new system is kind of in the widget. Uh, you got the check detail. This is a balance sheet thing because it's going to show you checks, which decrease the checking account. But you might be paying your bills with the bank feeds, mainly with check forms. That's why I think they might put it down here in the expenses area. Expenses by vendor summary. So now we're looking at the income statement, similar to what we did on the income line with the expense line. I can break out the expense line. Notice what we broke them out as here. How, how did I create this expense? Well, if I go into it, what did we do? We, we entered the vendor, we entered a vendor and we said we owe the vendor 15,000. And then QuickBooks made a bill and it dumped the other side into an expense. Because usually when you enter a bill, you don't, you, the other side goes to an expense. Now, it just made up a category of miscellaneous expense. But with the expenses, we usually do not categorize them by vendor. Notice it didn't make an Epiphone expense, which was the vendor that we bought the guitars from. Instead, it said miscellaneous. That's what we do. We make a category. So just like with the income, we didn't break it out by customer or get too detailed on what we sell. We just have general categories. 
similarly down here, although you're going to have a lot more expenses. We don't call it uh, Epiphone expense. We call it if it whatever we paid for. If it was a utility bill, we call it utilities expense, electric expense, telephone expense. Then the, we have to break. We could make a sub ledger breaking it out by who we paid, which means the vendor. So now I can have expenses by vendor giving us more detail about it by who we paid. And then we've got open purchase order list. Purchase orders would only be there if you have inventory. We'll talk more about them uh, in the future. And even then, you might not always have the purchase order, but we'll get into them in more detail. Another purchase order report. Purchases and product detail. So purchases are different than expenses in that if you make purchases, you're generally thinking of inventory items that we're purchasing as opposed to paying vendors for expenses like the telephone company. And then we've got the transaction list by vendor and the vendor contact list just giving us contact information. We have the sales tax, sales tax liability, uh, taxable sales detail and taxable sales summary. These might be somewhat obsolete. Uh, well, they still could be good reports, but there's a whole nother sales tax widget that you might use to help you process the sales tax if you're processing the sales tax within uh, the QuickBooks system. We'll talk a little bit more about that in our practice problem. And then we have the employee reports. So this will give us more information about the accounts related to employees. We didn't put any employee accounts on here yet because they were the beginning balances. Although in practice, you might have some liability reports as you start out that would be payroll liabilities, but nothing would be on the profit and loss for the current period because we wanted to start the payroll as of the first day of the new year, January 1st, 2023. But the payroll accounts that you would expect to have is on the income statement, payroll expense and payroll taxes generally at a minimum. And then on the balance sheet, you can have payroll liability accounts for the withholdings that you can have to pay out that are going to include the federal income tax, social security, Medicare on the employee and employer side, as well as any benefits that you're taking 401k plan and so on. So recent, so we'll talk more about them as we go a little bit more uh, for my accountant. So these are the reports that are for the accountant, meaning they're going to have debits and credits in them, or they're duplicates. They're already listed up top in the financial reports. Uh, so we have, or they're long listed reports, long detailed reports. So we got the account list, just a list of accounts in essence. You've got the balance sheet. This is a repeat. We already saw that. So I, I don't like that they put that here because we already saw it up top. They're housing it twice. A balance sheet. We already saw that up top in the general reports. You've got the general ledger. This report used to be something, I'm going to open it up, that we used all the time because when we had paper filing, we had to, we had to then get the general ledger report, 010123 to 123 that gives us all the detail so I can look at the transactions. These days, it's not as important because you can most likely give access to your file for tax preparation at the end of the year to your accountant. So this is, this is a similar, I'm just going to close some of these. This is similar to like if you went to your balance sheet and then just drill down on the detail, it's giving you the detail by date of the transactions. So then if I go into the journal, similar kind of thing, it's going to give us the detail, but it's not going to be by account. It'll be by transaction. This is actually a really good report for learning. And it's in a new format. I'll custom date, go from 010123123123. And we could see what we did here. So we entered these transactions in when we entered our beginning balances. And you can, and this is really a, a good report if you wanted to look at it and figure out what you're doing from a debit and credit standpoint. So we entered, for example, our opening balances and you, and, and you could say, okay, what did it do when I entered this invoice? What did that do? Well, that it did that when I tried to enter my accounts receivable and we made customers. So what did it do? For each customer, it, it, it added a, an invoice and each invoice had a transaction of a debit and uh, a credit. Does it show that? account numbers the account number is uh not here but you can then drill down into the account account numbers uh the actual accounts which was an increase to the accounts receivable on the other side they put into an income account right and then it did the same thing for the second customer jones another journal entry debit and credit and then we then what did this bill come from 
Well, the bill happened when we tried to create the liability of accounts payable. We told it to give them a vendor and then it just made a bill for it. And what did it do with that bill? It, the bill then, that form, created a credit to the accounts payable and the debit went into an expense account that they dumped into the income statement over here. And so, okay, so then the deposit form, what did it do there? Well, that happened when we made the checking account and we made a deposit into the checking account and they dumped the other side into opening balance equity, which we then rolled into owner's equity. So that's the deposit. Journal entry, the 75,000, where did that come from? That was the journal entry to put on our asset of the fixed asset, 75,000. It dumped the other side into opening balance equity. So debit here. And then what about this, the 7,500? Well, that's the accumulated depreciation. We had to credit this one. The other side went into opening balance equity. Credit card, well, th what happened there? Well, we credited the credit card to put it on the books and then it dumped the other side, I think, into opening balance equity. And then, and then this one is our adjustment of opening balance equity, I believe, to close it out so that we now have zero in the opening balance equity. And then, and then this one was us moving the information out of, I think this one was the one taking it out of opening balance equity and putting it into, putting it into retained earnings. So I so I'm get confused between these two. I'm not going to get into it in detail, but you get the idea. And then what are these? These are the inventory ones. So remember when we did inventory, how did we put that on the books? We just went into inventory. We told it that we had these inventory items at a cost and a sales price. It used this form, inventory starting form, to put it on there for each category of inventory. So I'm going to have one, two, three, four, five, six journal entries. And you can see the debits and credits are going to increase with a debit, the inventory, and then they dump the other side somewhere, I think, to opening balance equity. And so they did that here. You had the same thing, inventory, inventory, inventory. So as we go, this is actually a good report to kind of review what has happened. Also, uh, if, we start, if we started at the same point in time, meaning... Uh, on the balance sheet, we had nothing before this section. And then we were to match out our journal reports. If your journal report ties out exactly to this journal report, which is a little difficult to see because we don't have, it's not showing the accounts, which is kind of annoying. But if your journal report tied out exactly to this journal report, then, then your ending balance has to work. Now, if I have something on my side that you don't have on your side, it's likely it's a date issue. So it's likely that you accidentally entered something as of a different date because QuickBooks usually defaults to the current date. So try changing the date up to like 2024 and then see if it appears and see if, see if you have any transactions that are, are above my current date. And then you can drill down on that transaction and change it back to 2023 if you so choose. Okay, let's go back to the first tab. Profit and loss, we already saw that up top. That's a duplicate report. All of these are duplicates. I don't think they should have them down here because we already see them in the, up top. Uh, recent transactions give you recent transactions. That could be nice, uh, kind of like that audit trail report to see what has happened recently. Reconciliation reports are like bank and credit card reconciliation reports. We'll talk more about that in a future section or course. Uh, recurring transaction list, if you have transactions that you've put in that are going to be reoccurring. The statement of cash flows, we already saw it up top. It's a major financial statement report. It's duplicated down here. Transaction detail by account. This is similar to the general ledger, giving us the information for all the transactions by account. That would be a very long report. And then we've got the transaction list by date. This is another one that we're going to take a look at. I'm going to open it up at the end of each section, basically. So if I go into this one, close up the hand boogie, and we say range change, let's do a custom 01, 01, 23, 12, 31, 23. So now this is similar to the journal report, but this time it's more compact. Rather than giving us all the detail, it's just giving it by line item. So this, this will be a problem for some transactions which have more than two accounts impacted 
But if there are only two accounts affected, this report's very nice to look at. Uh, and it also eliminates the, the debits and credits. So you can think of it as just increases and decreases if you don't want to think of it in terms of debits and credits. But the debits and credits are actually quite useful. But in any case, like here, so here's the invoice again. So we have these invoices. Here's our three invoices that we put in place to put on the accounts receivable. You can see the name here and you can see the account is accounts receivable. And then, over, uh, what did I do? Now I sorted it over here. You could change the sorting. I did that on purpose so you could show that. Location, I can get rid of that. Let's make this smaller. And so then you can see if there's only two accounts affected, you can so here's accounts receivable, the other side went to revenue, right? And then here's the bill. That's the one that went to, that's the one that we did for the accounts payable. Here's the accounts payable. The other side went to the income statement miscellaneous expense. Here's the deposit to increase the checking account. Went to the checking account. The other side went to opening balance equity. Here's a journal entry. So it didn't give us the detail on this one because for some, even though there's only two accounts impacted, I think it still is giving us these dashes. That's why that's what this report doesn't do great. You can drill down on it and see that transaction. Uh, but like I say, it's that's the limitation of this report. Let's drill down on it. Uh, so there's a credit card. Okay. Any case, this one's the, the I clicked on the credit. This one's the credit card. So you could see it went the other side went to opening balance equity and then the inventory all the inventory ones opening balance and then the other one went to inventory assets those are the two sides so again we will look at this report basically at the end of each section if you have the same beginning balances such as for example the trial balance numbers at the start of the section we're ending a section now so if these numbers are correct as of now then at the end of the next section, which will be a long section because we'll do a whole month of data input, we will run this report again. If your numbers tie out to these numbers and you have the same reports, then generally it has to be the case if it was exactly the same that your ending balances would tie out to our balances. In other words, the ending numbers when I run this as of the end of the first month of operations, which will be at the end of January 2023, then it'll tie out exactly. So that's going to that's going to be how we will use it. You also might use this report for like billing purposes, for example, because you could try to charge people by the number of transactions that you had. One way to do that easily would be to export this report to Excel, use Excel to count the lines. However, you can also do that with the journal reports, you might export the journal reports, because some transactions might have more detail in it. So you might look at the number of accounts that were impacted and make your billing rates based on that. Uh, so that's another way that you might use this. this these two reports are also great for grading in a school setting because you can see what people have actually done, see if they actually did the work or they kind of cheated, they put a journal entry in. Or if you're a supervisor, same thing. Uh, how much did they actually do? You can see the detail of, of what was actually done with these uh, with these reports. So, like I say, if we started at zero, so there was no trial balance before, if your numbers match this number, these numbers in our transactions, then your ending balance has to tie out, right, to this would be the, the theory of it. And uh, if they don't, if it doesn't tie out, then... If there's a difference in the dollar amount, then you can drill down to the source document because QuickBooks is quite flexible with that kind of thing and possibly change it. And if there's something on our side that isn't on your side, change the date to a, to a later date because it's likely it's a date issue. That's the most common thing. And then drill down onto the document and change the date. If there's something on your side that is not on our side, then possibly you can delete that transaction because once again, QuickBooks is quite flexible. Most of the data input that has been put in place, you can drill down to the form and delete it, or if not, just zero out the data that's within it. So that's how we're gonna go going forward.